Hi Zoe. <clears throat> Hi Teddy. Just wait for a few more people to join before I start. <clears throat> Hi Fred, hi Sid. It's nice to see you guys coming back. It's great. Hope you've had a good day. The weather's lovely today. Sadly I didn't go outside. Hi Joe. Hey. I stayed in today pretty much. Did a little bit of tutoring. Um Hi Jacob, I am back again, sadly. Can't be that bad if you're back again. If you're back again, that is. <clears throat> right, let's finish. Just sharing it to a few there's a set a couple of groups that are really interested um, so I'm just making sure that I send them the the, uh, the link um, just so we can spread a story essentially as you know that's why we're doing it <clears throat> so um fourth day four days we've been doing this and some of you, I think nearly all of you actually, have been um, have been watching it from the start, which is amazing. I never really thought I would be doing this to um, to a fairly large audience. Um, I think the first video has about six hundred views, so that's that's way way more than I anticipated, um, which is incredible. So thank you. Um, the more we can you know, spread uh, a good story, the better. That's all I wanted. Um, Caroline's mentioned today, she made a really good suggestion last night about creating a poll or something uh, and see if you got, see what books you want me to read next, if you do want me to read another book. Um, I'm open to any suggestion. I can, rather than, I don't have very many physical copies. I do a lot of my reading uh, on my Kindle. So, um, I don't mind downloading a book or, you know, I'm happy to take suggestions. Um, something, you know, that's a bit more child friendly, uh, that, you know, obviously you want children to access this. So, um, so something that's a bit more suitable for them, that'd be great. But please comment away. I'm happy for, for you guys to, to suggest things. Um, <clears throat> I've got my water. I say water, it's got elderflower in it. Love elderflower. I know what you're thinking. I've got the music on tonight. I realised I didn't play it last night, but hey ho. Um, charging, laptop's charging, the light's flickering. Um, cool, I think we'll start if that's alright. So we're gonna do um we're gonna do uh, 13, 14, 15, 16. And 17 tonight, so we're going to five, five chapters. Um, it's only because of short chapters, that's the only reason. Um, I think the author tries to pick the, pick the pace up a little bit and moves the story forward, so the chapters are shorter. Um, which leaves uh, tomorrow uh, around about 30, 40, about 30, 33 pages left. So by the end of tonight, we'll be, uh, we'll be on the home stretch. So thanks again for, for tuning in. So chapter 13. So Torpthorn came into that spring weakened severely by his illness and still with a husky cough, but he had survived. We had both survived. There was hard ground to go now and the grass grew once more in the field so that our bodies began to fill out again and our coats lost the winter raggedness and shone in the sun. The sun shone too on the soldiers, whose uniforms of grey and red stayed cleaner. They shaved more often now and they began as always they did every spring to talk to the end of the war and about how home and about how the next attack would finish it 
and how they would see their families again soon. They were happier, and so they treated us that much better. The rations improved too, with the weather, and our gun team stepped out with new enthusiasm and purpose. The sores disappeared from our legs and we had full bellies each day. All the grass we could eat, and oats in plenty. The two little halflingers puffed and snorted behind us, and they, and they shamed Torkthorn and me into a gallop, something we'd not been able to, to achieve all winter, no matter how hard our riders tried to whip us on. Our newfound health and optimism of the singing, whistling soldiers brought us to a fresh sense of exhilaration as we rolled out our guns along the pitted roads into position. There were, no, there were to be no battles for us that summer. There was always sporadic firing and shelling, but the army seemed content to growl at each other and threaten without ever coming to grips. Further away from the courts, we heard the renewed fury of the spring offensive up and down the line but we were not needed to move our guns and spend the summer in comparative peace some way behind the lines. Idleness, even boredom, as we set in and gazed upon the lush buttercup meadows, and we even became fat for the first time since we came to war. Perhaps it was because we became too fat that Torkthon and I were chosen to pull the ammunition cart from the railhead some miles away up to the artillery, artillery lines. And so we found ourselves under the command of the kind old soldier who had been so good to us all winter. Everyone called him Old Mad, old mad Friedrich. He was thought to be mad because he talked continuously to himself, and even when he was not talking and laughing and chortling at some private joke that he never shared with anyone, Mad Old Friedrich was the old soldier that used to set to work on tasks no one else has wanted to do, because he was always obliging and everyone knew it. In the heat and the dust, it was tedious and strenuous work that took, that took off our excess weight and began to sap strength once more. The cart was always too heavy for us to pull because they insisted at the railhead on fi filling it up with as many shells as possible, in spite of Friedrich's protestations. They simply laughed at him, ignored him and piled on the shells. On the way back to the artillery lines, Friedrich would always walk up the hills, leading us slowly for he knew how heavy the wagon must have been. We stopped often for rests and for water, and he made quite sure that we had more than enough food than the other horses who were resting all that summer. We came to look forward now to each morning when Friedrich would come to fetch us from the field, put on our harnesses, and we would leave the noise and bustle of the camp behind us. We soon discovered that Friedrich was not in the slightest bit mad, but simply a kind and gentle man whose whole nature cried out against fighting a war. He confessed to us as we plodded along the road to the railroad to the railhead that he longed only to be back in his butcher shops in Schleiden, and that he talked to himself because he felt like he was the only one who understood himself, or would not even listen to what he, what he was saying, or would even listen to what he was saying. He laughed to himself, he said, because he did not, if he did not laugh, he would cry. I tell you, my friends, he said one day, I'll tell you that I'm the only sane man in the regiment. It is the others that are mad, but they don't know it. They fight a war, and they don't know what for. Isn't that crazy? How can one man kill another, and not really know the reason why he does it, except that the other man wears a different colour uniform, and speaks a different language? And it's me they call mad. You two are only rational creatures I've met in this benighted war. And like me, the only reason you're here is because we brought you here. If I had the courage, and I haven't. We'd take off down this road and never come back. But then they'd shoot me when they'd caught me, and my wife and my children and my mother and my father would have the same would have the shame of it on them forever. As it is, I'm going to live out this war as mad old Friedrich, so that I can return again to Schleiden and become butcher Friedrich that everyone knew and respected before all this mess began. As the weeks passed, it became apparent that Friedrich took a particular liking to Topthor, knowing he had been ill and he took more time and care over him, attending to the slightest sore before it could develop and make life uncomfortable for Topthorn. He was kind to me as well, but I think he never really had the same affection for me. It was noticeable that he would often stand back and simply gaze at Topthorn with love and glowing admiration in his eyes. There seemed to be an empathy between them, of that one old soldier to another. The summer passed slowly into autumn, and it became clear that our time with Friedrich was coming to an end. Such was Friedrich's attachment to Torkthorn by now that he volunteered to ride him out onto the gun team exercises that were to precede the autumn campaign. Of course, all the guns laughed at the suggestion, 
but they were short of good horsemen, and no one denied he was that, and so we found ourselves the leading pair once again with Madol Friedrich riding up, riding up on top of them. We had found at last a true friend, and one we could trust implicitly. If I had to die out there and make my way home, Friedrich confided with Topham one day, I would rather die alongside you, but I'll do my best to see that we all get through and back home. That much, I promise you. Chapter 14 So Friedrich rode with us that autumn day, <clears throat> when we went to war again. The gun troop was resting at midday under the welcome shade of a large chestnut wood that would covered both banks of a silver glinting river that was full of splashing laughing men. As we moved in amongst the trees and the guns were unhitched, I saw that the entire wood was crowded with resting soldiers, their helmets, packs and rifles laying beside them. They sat back against the trees smoking or lay out flat on their backs and slept. As we had come to expect, a crowd of them soon came over to fondle the two golden halflings. But one young soldier approached Topthorn and stood looking up at him, his face full of open admiration. Now there is a horse, he said, calling his friend over. Come and look at this one, Carl. Have you ever seen a finer looking animal? He has the head of an arrow. You can see the speed of an English thoroughbred in his legs and the strength of a Hanoverian in his back and in his neck. He has the best of everything and he reached up and gently rubbed his fist against Topborn's nose. Don't you ever think about anything else except horses, Rudy, said his companion, keeping his distance. Three years I've known you, and not a day goes by without you going on about those wretched creatures. I know you were brought up with them on your farm, but I still can't understand what it is you see in them. They are just four legs, a head and a tail, all controlled by a very little brain that can't think beyond food and drink. How can you say that, said Rudy? Just look at him, Carl. Can you not see that he's something special? This one isn't just any old horse. There's a nobility in his eye, a regal serenity about him. Does he not personify all that men, all that men try to be and can never be? I tell you, my friend, there's divinity in a horse, and special in a horse like this. God got it right the day he created them. And to find a horse like this in the middle of this filthy abomination of war is for me like finding a butter dance. Ooh. Them. We don't belong in the same universe as a creature like this. To me the soldiers had appeared to become younger as the war went on, and certainly Rudy was no exception to this. Under his short cropped hair that was still damp for wearing his helmet, he looked barely the same age as my Albert as I remembered him, and like so many of them now he looked, without his helmet, like a, like a child dressed up as a soldier. When Friedrich let us down the river to drink, Rudy and his friend came up with us. Torkthorn lowered his head in the water beside me and shook it vigorously, as he usually did, showering me all over his face and neck, and bringing me sweet relief from the heat. He drank long and deep afterwards, and we stood together for a few moments on the riverbank, watching the soldiers frolicking in the water. The hill back up to the woods was steep and rutty, so it was mm -hmm. no surprise that Torkthorn stumbled once or twice. He had never been as sure-footed as I was, but he regained his balance each time and plodded on beside me up the hill. However, I did notice that he was moving rather wearily and sluggishly, that each step as he went up was becoming more and more of an effort for him. His breathing was short and rasping. Then, as we neared the shades of the trees, Torkthorn stumbled to his knees and did not get up again. I stopped for a moment to give him time to get up, but he did not. He lay where he, went, where he was, breathing heavily, and lifted his head once to look at me. It was an appeal for help. I could see it in his eyes. Then he slumped forward on his face, rolled over and was quite still. His tongue hung from his mouth and his eyes looked up at me without seeing me. I bent down to nuzzle him, pushing at his neck in a frantic effort to make him move, to wake him up, but I knew instinctively that he was already dead, that I had lost my best and dearest friend. Friedrich was down on his knees behind him, his ear pressed to Torkthorn's chest. He shook his head and sat back and looked up at the group of men that had now gathered around us. He's dead, Friedrich said quietly, and then more angrily, angrily, for God's sake, he's dead. His face was heavy with sadness. Why, he said, why does this war have to destroy anything and everything that's fine and beautiful? He covered his eyes with his hands and Rudy lifted him gently to his feet. Nothing you can do, old man, he said. He's well out of it. Come on. But old Friedrich would not be led away. He 
He turned once more to Topthorn, still licking and nuzzling him where he lay. Although I knew, and indeed understood by now, the finality of death, but in my grief I only felt that I wanted to stay with him and to comfort him. The veterinary officer attached to the troop came running down the hill, followed all, by all the officers and men in the troop who had just heard what happened. After a brief inspection, he too pronounced Topthorn to be dead. I thought so, I told you so, he said almost to himself. They can't do it. I see it all the time. Too much work on short rations and living out all winter. I see it all the time. A horse like this can only stand so much. Heart failure, poor fellow. It makes me angry every time it happens. But we could not treat horses like this. We treat our machines better. He was a friend, said Reach Friedrich simply, kneeling down over again, top, kneeling down over again, over Topthorn, and removing his uh, head collar. The soldiers stood all around us in complete silence, looking down at the prostate form of Topthorn, in a moment of spontaneous respect and sadness. Perhaps it was because they had known him for a long time, and that in some way they had become part of their, he had become part of their lives. As we stood silent on the hillside, I heard the first whistle of a shell above us, and saw the first explosion as a shell landed in the river. Suddenly the wood was alive and shouting. Rushing so soldiers and shells were falling around us all everywhere. The men in the river, half naked and screaming, ran up to the trees and shelling seemed to follow them. Trees crashed to the ground and horses and men came running out of the wood in the direction of the ridge above us. My first inclination was to run with them, to run anywhere to escape the shelling, but Torkthorn lay dead at my feet and I would not abandon him. Friedrich, who was holding me now, who was holding me now tried all he could to drag me away, up behind the so shoulder of the hill, shouting and screaming at me to come if I wanted to live. But no man can move a horse that does not wish to be moved, and I did not want to go. As the shelling intensified and he found himself more and more isolated from his friends, as he swarmed away up the hill and out of sight, he threw down my reins and tried to make his escape. But he was too slow, and he had left it too late. He never reached the woods. He was struck down, only but only a few paces from Torkthorn, rolled back down the hill, and lay still beside him. At last I saw of my troop, where the bobbing white manes of Tulis were halfling as he struggled to pull the gun up through the trees, with the gunners hauling frantically on their reins and straining to push the gun from behind. <clears throat> Chapter 15 I stood by Torkthorn and Friedrich all that day and into the night, leave them only one leaving them only once to drink briefly at the river. The shelling moved back and forth along the valley, showering grass and earth and trees into the air and leaving behind craters that smoked as if the earth itself was on fire. But any fear I might have was overwhelmed by a powerful sense of sadness and love that compelled me to stay with Torkthorn for as long as I could. I knew that once he left, I knew that once I left him, I would be alone in the world again, but I would no longer have his strength and support beside me. So I stayed with him and waited. I remember it was near first light and I was cropping the grass close to where he lay. And when I heard through the crump and whistle of the shells, the whining sound of motors accompanied by a terrifying rattle of steel that set my ears back against my head. It came from over the ridge, from the direction in which the soldiers had disappeared. A grating, roaring sound that came even nearer by the minute and louder again as the shelling died away completely. Although at the time I did not know it, it as such, the first tank I ever saw came over the rise of the hill, with the cold light of dawn behind it, a great grey lumbering monster that belched out smoke from behind it as it rocketed down the hillside towards me. I hesitated only a few moments before blind terror tore me at last from top one side and sent me bolting down the hill towards the river. I crashed into the river without even knowing whether I should find my feet or not, and it was halfway up the wooded hill on the other side before I dared stop and turn to see if it was still chasing me. I should never have looked, for the one monster that had become several monsters and they were rolling inexorably down towards me, already past the place where Torkthorn lay with Friedrich on the shattered hillside. I waited, secure, I thought, in the shelter of the trees, and I watched the tanks ford the river before turning once more to run. I ran, I knew not where, I ran till I could no longer hear that dreadful rattle until the gun seemed far away. I remember crossing the river again, 
galloping through the empty farm farmyards, jumping fences and ditches and abandoned trenches, and clattering through the deserted ruined villages before I found myself grazing that evening in a lush wet meadow and drinking from a clear pebbly brook. And then exhaustion finally overtook me, sapped the strength from my legs and forced me to lie down and sleep. When I woke it was dark and the guns were firing once more all around, all around me. No matter where I looked, it seemed the sky was lit with yellow flashes of gunfire and intermittent white glowing lights that pained my eyes and showered daylight briefly into the countryside around me. Whichever way it went, I seemed it had to be towards the gun. guns. Better, therefore, I thought to stay where I was. Here, at least, I had grass and plenty of water to drink. I had made my mind up to do just that when there was an explosion of white light above my head and the rattle of machine guns split the air night. The bullets whipping into the ground beside me. I ran again and kept running into the night, stumbling frequently in the ditches and hedges until the fields lost their grass and the trees were just stumps against the flashing skyline. Wherever I went now there were great craters in the ground filled with murky stagnant water. It was as I staggered out of one of the craters that I lumbered into an invisible coil of barbed wire that first snagged and then trapped my foreleg. As I kicked up wildly to free myself, I felt the barbs tearing into my foreleg before I broke, broke clear. From then on I could only manage to limp on slowly into the night, feeling my way forward. Even so I must have walked for miles, but where to and where from I shall never know. All the while my leg pulsated with pain on, and on every side of me the great guns were sounding out and rifle fire spat into the night. Bleeding, bruised and terrified beyond belief, I longed only to be with Torkborn again. He would know which way to go, I told myself. He would know. I stumbled on into the night, guided only by the belief that where the night was at the blackest, there, there alone I might find some safety from the shelling. Behind me the thunder and lightning of the bombardment was so terrible in its intensity, turning the deep black of the night in, into an unnatural day, that I could not contemplate going back, even though I knew it was in the, in the right direction that Torpthorn lay. There was some gunfire ahead of me and on both sides, but I could see that away in the distance a black horizon of undisturbed night, and so I moved steadily towards it. My wounded leg was stiffening up all the time in the cold of the night, and it pained me now even to lift it. Very soon I found I found I could put no weight on it at all. This was to be the longest night of my life, the nightmare of agony and terror and loneliness. I suppose it was only a long instinct to survive that compelled me to walk on and keep me on my feet. I sensed that my only chance lay in putting the noise of the battle as far behind me as possible, so I had to keep moving. From time to time rifle fire and machine gun fire would crackle all around me, and I would stand paralysed with fear, terrified to move in any direction until the firing stopped and I found my muscles could not move one and I found my muscles could move once more. To begin with I found the mists hovering over the depths of the craters as I passed. But after some hours I found myself increasingly surrounded in a thick, smoky, autumnal mist through which I could only see the vague shades and shapes of dark and light around me. Almost blinded now, I re relied totally on the ever more distant roar and rumble of the, of, the, of the bombardment, keeping it all the time behind me and moving towards the darker, more silent world ahead of me. Dawn was already, br already brightening. Yeah. Dawn was already brightening the gloom of the mist when I heard the sound of hushed, urgent voices ahead of me. I stood quite still and listened, straining my eyes to find the people of whom they belonged. Stand to, get a move on, get a move on lads. The voices were muffled in the mist. There was a the sound of rushing feet and clattering rifles. Pick it up lad, pick it up. What do you think you're about? Now clean that rifle off and do it sharpish. A long silence followed and I moved gingerly towards the voices, both tempted and terrified at the same time. There it is again, Sarge. I saw something. Honest, I did. When was What was it then, son? The whole German ruddy army? Or just one or two of them? Out for a morning stroll? Weren't a man, Sarge. Not even a German either. Looked more like an horse or a cow to me. A cow or a horse? Out there in no man's land? And how the blazes do you think it got there, son? You've been staying up too late. Your eyes is playing tricks on you. I heard it too, Sarge and all. Honest, Sarge. Cross me heart. Well, I can't see nothing. I can't see nothing, son. And that's because there's nothing there. You're all of a jitter. And your jittering has just about brought the whole ruddy battalion onto, 
on Stantu half an hour early. And who's going to be a popular little lad when, he tell, when I tell the lieutenant all about it? Spoiled his beauty sleep, haven't you, son? You go and waken up the lovely captains and majors and brigadiers and all of them nice sergeants and all, just because you thought you'd seen a flaming horse. And then in a louder voice, that was intended to carry further. But seeing as how we're all stood... Yeah. But seeing as how we're all stood too, and there's pea soup flaming London smog out there, and seeing how Jerry likes to come and knocking on our little dugouts just when we can't see him a coming, I want you I want you lads to keep your eyes peeled back and wide open. Then we'll all live to eat our breakfasts, if it's on this morning. There'll be a rum ration coming round in a few minutes. That'll be light for you. That'll that'll light you up. But until then, I want every one of your eyes skinned. As he spoke, I limped away. I could feel myself shaking from head to tail in dreadful anticipation of the next bullet or shell, and I only wanted to be alone, away from any noise whatever, whether it not whether it, whether it or not appeared to be threatening. In my weakened, frightened condition, any sense of reason had left me, and I wandered now through the mists until my good legs could drag me no further. I stood at last, resting on my bleeding leg, on a soft, fresh mound of mud beside a foul-smelling, water-filled crater, and I snuffed the ground in vain for something to eat. But the earth where I stood was bare of grass, and I had neither the energy nor the will at that moment to move forward another step. I lifted my head again to look about me in case I should discover any grass nearby, and as I did, I so felt the, f and I, I felt the first sunlight filter through the mist and touch my back, sending gentle shivers of warmth through my cold, cramped body. Within minutes, the mist began to clear away, and I saw for the first time that I stood in a wide corridor of mud, a wasted, shattered landscape between two vast, unending rolls of barbed wire that stretched into the distance behind me and in front of me. I remembered that I had been in such a place once before, that day when I had charged across it with Topthorn and beside me. This was what the war soldiers called No Man's Land. <laughs> oh, chapter 16. Uh, it's going well. All right, guys, those have just joined. Oh, with the itchy nose tonight. Cool. So, two chapters. That should take us to about eight o'clock. I don't want to run too close to eight o'clock because, um, yeah, because of the, the NHS clapping. Thing. We should all be outside clapping uh, to show our appreciation for that. So um, I am conscious of the time. Chapter 16. From both sides of me I heard a gradual crescendo of excitement and laughter rippling along the trenches, interspersed with barked orders that everyone was to keep their heads down and no one was to shoot. From my vantage point on the mound I could only see an occasional glimpse of a steel helmet my only evidence that the voices I was hearing did indeed belong to real people. There was the sweet smell of cooking food wafting towards me as I lifted my nose to savour it. It was sweeter than the sweetest bran mash I'd ever tasted, and it had a tinge of salt about it. I was drawn first one way and then the other by this promise of warm food, but each time I neared the trenches on either side I met an impenetrable barrier of loosely coiled barbed wire. The soldiers cheered me on as I came closer showing their heads fully now over the trenches and beckoning me towards them. And when I had to turn back at the wire and cross no man's land to the other side, I was welcomed again by the chorus of whistling and clapping. But again, I could find no way through the wire. I must have crisscrossed no man's land for much of that morning and found at long last in the middle of the, this blasted wilderness, a small patch of coarse, dank grass growing up on the tip, on the lip of an old crater. I was busying myself and tearing the last of this away when I saw, out of the corner of my eye, a man in grey uniform clamber up out of the trenches, wave, waving a white flag above his head. I looked up as he began to clip his way methodically through the wire and then pull it aside. All this time there was much argument and noisy consternation from the other side, and soon a small helmeted figure in a flapping khaki grey coat climbed up into no man's land. He too held up a white handkerchief in one hand, and began also to work his way through the wire towards me. The German was through the wire first, leaving a narrow gap behind him. 
He approached me slowly across no man's land, calling out to me all the while to come towards him. He reminded me at once of the dear old, of dear old Friedrich, for he was, like Friedrich, a grey a grey haired man in an untidy, unbuttoned uniform, and he spoke gently to me. In one hand he held a rope, the other hand he stretched out towards me. He was still far too far away for me to see clearly, but often the hand in my experience was often cupped, and there was enough promise in that for me to limp cautiously towards him. On both sides of the trenches were lined now with cheering men, standing on parapets waving their helmets above their heads. Oi, boyo! The shout came from behind me, and that was urgent enough to stop me. I turned to see the small man in the khaki weaving and jinking his way across no man's land. One man, one hand held high above his head, carrying a white handkerchief. Oi, boyo, where are you going? Hang on a bit. You're going the wrong way, see? The two men who were coming towards me could not be more different. The one in grey was the taller of the two, and as he came nearer I could see his face was lined with creased and creased with years. Everything about him was slow and gentle under his ill-fitting uniform. He wore no helmet, but insisted, but instead the peakless cap with the red band I knew so well sitting carelessly on the back of his head. The little man in khaki reached out reached us out of breath his red face and still smooth youth, his round helmet and a broad rim fallen askew over one ear. For a few he straight for a few strained silent moments the two stood jars apart from each other, eyeing one another wearily and not saying a word. It was a young man in a khaki who broke the silence and spoke first. No, what do we do? he said, walking towards us and looking at the German who stood head and shoulders above him. There's two of us here, and one horse to split between us. Of course, King Solomon had an answer, didn't he now? But it's not very practical in this case, is it? And what's worse, I can't speak a word of German. And I can't see and I can't and I can see you can't understand what the hell I'm talking about, can you? Oh hell. I should never have come out here. I knew I shouldn't. Can't think what came over me. And all for a muddy old horse too. But I can speak a little But I can. I can speak a, speak a little bad English, said the older man still holding out a cut hand under my nose. It was full of black bread broken into pieces, a titbit. It was familiar enough, but usually with, but usually found too bitter for my taste. However, I was now too hungry to be choosy. And as I was speaking, I soon emptied his hand. I speak only a little English, like a schoolboy, but it's enough, I think, for us. And even as he spoke, I felt a little rope slip slowly around my neck and tighten. As for our other problem, since I have been here first, then the horse is mine. Fair? Like your cricket. Cricket? Cricket? said the young man. Who's ever he heard of that barbarous game in Wales? That's a game for the rotten English. Rugby. That's my game. And that's not a game. That's a religion, that is, where I come from. I played scum ha scrum half from Maystick before the war stopped me. And at Maesteg we stayed. We say that a loose ball is our ball. Sorry, said the German, his eyebrows furrowed with concern. I cannot understand what you mean by this. Doesn't matter, Jerry. Not important. Not any more. We could have settled all this peaceful like Jerry, the war I mean, and then I'd be back in my valley, and you'd be back in yours. Still, not your fault, and I don't suppose nor mine. Neither come to that. By now the cheering from both sides had subsided and both armies looked on in total silence as the two men talked together beside me. The Welshman was stroking my nose and feeling my ears. You know horses then, said the tall German. How bad is his wounded leg? Is it broken, do you think? He seems not to walk on it. The Welshman bent over and lifted my leg gently and expertly, wiping away the mud from around the wound. He's in a mess, right enough, but I don't think it's broken, Jerry. It's a bad enough wound, though. A deep gash, wire by the look of it. Got to get him, got to get him seen to quickly, else the poison will set in, and then there won't be a lot of any, anyone could do for him. Cut like that. He must have lost a lot of blood already. Question is though, who takes him? We've got a veterinary hospital somewhere back behind our lines that could take care of him, but I expect you've got one too. Yes, I think so. Somewhere it must be, but I do not know exactly where. The German said slowly. And then he dug deep in his pocket and produced a coin. Choose the side you want, head or tail. 
I think you say. I will show the coin to everyone on both sides, and everyone will know whichever side wins the horse. It is only by chance. And then no one loses any pride, yes? And everyone will be happy. The Welshman looked up admiringly and smiled. All right then, you go ahead, Jerry. You show them the coin, and then you toss, and I'll call. The German held the coin up in the sun and turned a full slow circle before spinning it, spinning it high and glinting into the air. As it fell to the ground, the Welshman called out in a large resonant voice so that all the world could hear, heads. Well, said the German, stooping up to pick it up, that's the face of my Kaiser looking up at me out of the mud, and he does not look pleased with me, so I'm afraid you've won. The horse is yours. Take good care of him, my friend. And he picked up the rope again and handed it to the Welshman. As he did so, he yelled out his other hand in a gesture of friendship and reconciliation, a, sm a smile lighting his worn face. In an hour, maybe, or two, he said, we will be trying our best again to kill each other. God only knows why we do it, and I think that, I, and I think he has maybe forgotten why. Goodbye, Welshman. We have shown them, haven't we? We have shown them that any problem can be solved between people, if only they can trust each other. That's all it needs. The little Welshman shook his head in disbelief as he took the rope. Jerry Boyle, I think if we would, I think if they would let you and me have an hour or two to get out here together, we could sort this whole wretched mess. There would be no more weeping widows and crying children in my valley, and no more in yours. If the horse came to the, if the worst came to the worst, we could decide it all by the flip of a coin, couldn't we now? If we did, said the German with a chuckle. If we did it that way, then it would be our turn to win, and maybe your Lord George would not like that. And he put his hands on the Welshman's shoulders for a brief moment. Take care, my friend, and good luck. Auf Wiedersehen. And he turned away and walked slowly back across no man's land to the wire. Same to you, boyo, the Welshman shouted after him. And then he too turned and led me, and led me away back across the line towards the khaki soldiers who began now to laugh and cheer with delight as I limped towards them through the gap in the wire. <clears throat> Hi, Phoebe. <laughs> you still think you're my favorite, I'm your favorite student. You're my favorite student? Yeah, you're my favorite student. Fair play. <clears throat> you're mad. So chapter 17. Chapter 17. We're doing well. So last chapter for tonight, and then tomorrow we'll finish the book. So like I said, it's quite a short, uh, short couple of chapters. Good chapters, though. It does. It does teach them so much. It's a brilliant book. Um, the last couple of chapters are quite hard to read, aren't they? I think they're easy to read out loud. You don't get. As, I don't feel as emotional as I would have read it if I was reading it in my head. I think when the hot one. Um, uh, Talkthorn died, is it? Oh God. If I read that, that usually affects me more. If I say it out loud, I don't know why. Anywho, probably because people are watching, I imagine. <clears throat> uh, so chapter 17. It was only with the greatest difficulty that I stayed standing on my three good legs in the vetry wagon that carried me that morning, away from the heroic little Welshman who had brought me in. A milling crowd of soldiers surrounded me to cheer me on my way. But out on the long, rattling roads, I was very soon shaken off my balance and fell in an ungainly, uncomfortable heap on the floor of my wagon. My injured leg throbbed terribly as the wagon rocked from side to side on its slow journey away from the battlefront. The wagon was drawn by two stocky black horses, both well groomed out and immaculate in their well-oiled harness. Weakened by long hours of pain and starvation, I had not the strength even to get back to my feet. When I felt the wheels below me running at last on smooth cobblestones and the wagon came to a jerking standstill in the warm, pale autumn sunshine. My arrival was greeted by a chorus of excited neighing and I raised my head to look. I could just see over the sideboards of wide cobbled courtyard with magnificent stables on either side and a great house with turrets beyond. Over every stable door there were heads of inquisitive horses ears pricked. There were men and khaki walking everywhere. 
and a few were running now towards me, one of them carrying a rope halter. Unloading was painful, for I had little strength left and my legs had gone numb after the long journey, but they got me to my feet and walked me backward gently down the ramp. I found myself at the centre of an anxious and admiring attention in the middle of the courtyard, surrounded by a cluster of soldiers who inspected minutely every part of me, feeling me all over. What in thunder do you think you're about, you lot? Came a booming voice echoing across the courtyard. It's an horse. It's just an horse, just like the others. A huge man was striding towards us, his boots crisps on, crisp on the cobbles. His heavy red face was half hidden by the shade of his peaked cap that almost touched his nose and by a ginger moustache that spread upwards from his lips to his ears. It may be a famous horse, it may be the only thundering horse in the old thundering war brought in alive from no man's land, but it's only a horse, a dirty horse at that. I've had some rough looking specimens brought here in my time, but this is the scruffiest, dirtiest horse I have ever seen. He is a thundering disgrace, and you all stood about looking at him. He wore three broad stripes on his arm, and the creases in, in his immaculate khaki uniform were razor sharp. Now there's a hundred more sick horses here in this hospital, and there's twelve of us to look after them. This here young layabout was detailed to look after this one when he arrived, so the rest of you blighters can get back to your duties. Move it, you old monkeys, move it. And the men scattered in all directions, leaving me with a young soldier who began to lead me away towards again towards the stable. And you, came that booming voice again. Major Martin will be down from the house ten minutes to examine that horse. Make sure that horse is so thundering clean and thundering shiny so you could use him as a shaving mirror, right? Yes, Sergeant, came the reply. A reply that sent a sudden, sudden shiver of recognition through me. Quite where I had the voice before, I did not know. I knew that only those two words sent a tremor of joy and hope and expectation through my body and warmed me from the inside out. He led me slowly across the cobbles and I tried all the while to see his face better, but he just kept that much ahead of me, so that all I could see was a neatly shaven neck and a pair of pink ears. How the devil did you get out? Oh, oh it's back again. How the devil did you get outside? Did you get yourself stuck out there in no man's land, you old silly? He said. That's what everyone wants to know, ever since the message came back that they'd be bringing you here. And how the devil did you get yourself in such a state? I swear there's not an interview that's not covered in mud or blood. Job to tell you what you look like under all that mess. Still, we'll soon see. I'll tie you up here and get the worst off it. Off in the open air. Then I'll brush you up in the proper manner before the officer gets here. Come on, you silly Jew. Once I've got you cleaned up and then the officer can see you, he'll tidy up that nasty cut of yours. Can't give you food, I'm sorry to say. Nor any water. Not till he says so. That's what the sergeant told me. That's just in case they have to operate on you. And the way he whistled, and the way he whistled as he cleaned the horses, as he cleaned out the brushes, was the whistle that went with his voice, I knew. It confirmed my rising hopes, and I knew that then I could not be mistaken. In my overwhelming delight, I reared on my back legs and cried out to him to recognise me. I wanted him to make him see who I was. Hey, careful, you silly. Nearly had my hat off, he said gently, keeping a, keeping a firm hold on the rope and smoothing my nose as always, he had, as he had always done whenever I was unhappy. No need for that, you'll be all right. Lots of fuss about nothing. New young horse once just like you, proper jumpy. He was till I got to know him, and he got to know me. You talking to them horses again, Albert? Came a voice from inside the next stable. God, struth. What makes you think they understand a perishing word that you say? Some of them may not, said Albert, but one day, one day one of them will. He'll come in here and he'll recognise my voice. He's bound to come in here. And then you'll see that a horse understands every word that's said to him. You're not on about your joey again. The head that came in the voice leant over the stable door. Won't you never give up, Bertie? I've told you before, if I've told you a thousand times, they say that there's near half a million bloody horses out there and you joined the veterinary corps just on the one-off chance that you might come across him. 
I pawed the ground with my bad leg in an effort to make Albert look at me more closely. He just patted my neck and set to work cleaning me up. There's just one and a half a million chance that your Joey walks in here. You've got to be more realistic. He could be dead. A lot of them are. He could have gone off to ruddy Palestine with the yeoman tree. He could be anywhere along hundreds of miles of trenches. If you weren't so ruddy good with horses and if you weren't this best friend I had, I'd think you'd be gone. And you'd be going a bit, going a bit screwy the way you go on about your Joey. You'll understand why when you see him, David. Albert said, crouching down to scrape the caked mud off my underside. You'll see. There's no horse like him anywhere in the whole world. He's a bright red with a black mane and tail. He has a white cross on his forehead and four white socks that are all even to the last inch. He stands over 16 hands and he's perfect from head to tail, I can tell you. I can tell you that when I see him. I can tell you that when you see him, you know him. I could pick him, pick him out of a crowd of a thousand horses. There's just something about him. Captain Nichols, you know him. Him that's dead now, the one I told you about that brought Joey from my bought Joey from my father. Him that sent me Joey's picture, he knew it. He saw it the first time in his eyes, his the first time his eyes set on him. I'll find him, David. That's where I came all this way for, and I'm going to find him. Either I'll find him, or he'll find me. I told you I made him a promise, and I'm going to keep it. You're round the ruddy twist, Bertie, said his friend, opening the stable door and coming over to examine my leg. Round the ruddy twist, that's all I can say. He picked up my hoof and lifted it gently. This one's got a white sock on its front legs anyway. That's as far as I can tell under this blood and mud. I'll just sponge the wound away a bit, clean it up for you whilst you're here. You'll never get this one. You'll never get this one cleaned up in time else. And I finished mucking out the ruddy stables. Not a lot else to do, and it looks like you could do with a hand. Old Sergeant Thunder won't mind, not if I've done all he told me, and I have. The two men worked tirelessly on me, scraping and brushing and washing. I stood quite still, trying only to nuzzle Albert, to make him turn and look at me. But he was busying at my tail and hindquarters now. Three, said his friend, washing off another one of my hooves. That's three white socks. Turn it up, David, said Albert. I know what you think. I know what everyone thinks. That'll never find him. There's thousands of army horses and four white socks. I know that, but there's only one with a blaze in the shape of a cross on his forehead. And how many horses shine red like fire in the evening sun? I tell you, there's not one like him. Not in the whole wide world. Four, said David. That's four legs and four white socks. Only the cross on the forehead now, and a splash of red paint on this muddy mess of a horse, and you have your Joey standing here. Don't tease, said Albert quietly. Don't tease, David. You know I'm serious about I you know how serious I am about Joey. It'll mean the world to me to find him again. Only friend I ever had before I came to the war, I told you. I grew up with him, I did. Only creature on this earth I felt any kinship for. David was standing now by my head. He lifted my mane and brushed gently at the first and then vigorously at my forehead, lowering the dust away from my eyes. He peered closely and then set again to brushing down towards the end of my nose and up again between my ears till I tossed my, he my head with impatience. Bertie, he said quietly, I'm not teasing, honest. I'm not. Not now. You said your Joey had four white socks, all even to the inch, right? Right, said Bertie, still brushing away at my tail. And you said Joey had a white cross on his forehead. Right. Albert was still completely disinterested. Now I have never seen a horse like that, Bertie, said David, using his hand to smooth down the hair on my forehead. Wouldn't have thought it possible. Well, it is, I tell you, said Albert sharply. And he was red, flaming red in the sunlight, like I said. I wouldn't have thought that possible, his friend went on, keeping his voice in check. Not until now, that is. Oh, pack it in, David, Albert said, and there was a genuine irritation in his voice now. I've told you, haven't I? I've told you I'm serious about Joey. So am I, Bertie. Dead serious. No messing. I'm serious. This horse has four white socks, all evenly marked like you said. This horse has a clear white cross on his head. This horse, as you can see for yourself, has a black mane and tail. This horse stands over sixteen hands, and when he's cleaned up, he'll look pretty as a picture. 
And this horse is a red bay under all that mud, just like you said, Bertie. As David was speaking, Albert suddenly dropped my tail and moved slowly around me, running his hand along my back. Then at last we stood facing one another. There was a rough hue to his face, a rougher hue to his face than I thought. He had more lines around his eyes, and he was a broader, bigger man in his, in his uniform than I remembered him. But he was my Albert, and there was no doubt about it. He was my Albert. Joey, he said tentatively, looking into my eyes. Joey. I tossed up my head and called out to him in my happiness, so that the sound echoed around the yard and brought horses and men to the door of their stables. It could be, said Albert quietly. You're right, David, it could be him. It sounds like him even, but there's one way to know for sure. And he untied my rope and pulled the halter off my head, and then he turned and walked away to the gateway before facing me, cupping, it, cupping his hands to his lips and whistling. It was his owl whistle. The same low, stuttering whistle he had used to call me when they were walking out together, back at home on the farm all those long years before. Suddenly there was no longer any pain in my leg, and I trotted easily over towards him and buried my nose in his shoulder. It's him, David, Albert said, putting his arms around my neck and hanging on to my mane. It's my Joey. I found him. He's come back to me just like I said he would. See? said David wryly. What did I tell you? See? Not often wrong, am I? Not often, said Albert. Not often, and not this time. Job done. On to chapter 18. So, we'll finish it off tomorrow. And thank you for watching and, uh, yeah, being a part of this. Uh, please share. Share the event page so people can, can obviously watch it from the start. Um, and, yeah, let's start to think about maybe what the next book could be. Um, hopefully something a bit happier, that'd be nice. Thanks guys.